Gut. Good morning, everyone. Um, my name is Klaus Schipper. I come from the European Space Agency, uh, where I work as a mission manager, and I'm especially uh, involved in the Biomass mission team. And I will give you in the next uh, 30 minutes or so, I would like to give you a short overview of the Biomass mission, which is a Polinza mission. So everything you have learned here in the course, you can apply to this mission when it gets eventually launched. Um, and uh, to bring this to practice. And in the second part, I will also introduce another mission, that's Roselle. It's another Elb and SAR mission. It has also a um, polarimetric capability and also interferometric capability. Um, and I will also introduce that mission, but that only comes in a few years' time, so it's uh, maybe less, less uh, urgent. Biomass, in a nutshell, um, it's Earth's ESA's seventh Earth Explorer mission. It should be deployed in 2025, in quarter one, 2025. It's an interferometric, polarimetric P band SAR mission. It's the first P band SAR mission that will ever uh, fly or that has ever been flown in space. And it's observed uh, mainly, or the main objective is to observe forest height and biomass in the of forests. Just to give you a bit of a context, um, you might be aware of. of ESA missions, there are basically three families of missions we built here on the right hand side, the orange part is meteorological missions um, that are specified by UMITSAT, where we just built the satellites and they operated by UMITSAT, and in the center part you have the Copernicus mission, that's maybe the missions you know most, that's the workhorse missions of ESA, it's operational missions that have proven already in the past um, to be um, successful, to have some operational applications and there you have several um, missions that we have built uh, for the European Commission that, that, that we operate together with the European Commission and then on the left hand part the screen part is our research component so these are missions where we try to answer new science questions where we try out new technologies to answer these science questions so they're really the cutting edge element of, of either satellite family and biomass is part of this this family now if we talk about um, Research missions at ESA, every of these research missions is um, defined by science questions. So the first thing is always you don't start from a mission concept, you always start from a science question. And then you try to build a satellite or measurement instrument that can answer the science questions. Now for biomass, the overarching science question is the global carbon cycle. Um, and especially the fate of the CO2, so where, where CO2 is uh, released to the atmosphere, where it's stored um, over land, so where there's the sources and the sinks of CO2. And then keep in mind, um, the biomass mission was proposed the first time in 2005, so it's nearly 20 years ago, uh, when this mission, when this science question was um, asked, uh, but it's still very relevant, so uh, we don't, I, I think there's not, not much change in the uncertainties of these components of the, of, the, of, the, of the questions we have, so even after 20 years, this is a very relevant um, question to ask. Now, if we look at the, co uh, at the global carbon budget, and this is a, a graphic that is uh, quite recent, or the numbers are quite recent, I think they are from uh, last year's global carbon project uh, carbon assessment. Um, then you can look at the atmosphere, and the atmosphere we actually know quite well, so we know how much uh, we emit to the, to the atmosphere, how much is... Um, how the atmospheric CO2 grows. Um, this you can do by, by measurements uh, of the atmosphere. You also know how much goes back in the, into the sinks. So from an atmospheric point of view, the top level part is actually quite well understood. Um, what is not so much or so well understood is um, the land sources and the land, land sinks. So if you, if you take the on the left-hand part, the screen part, the fossil fuel emissions, they are quite well known. Uh, you, you know how much oil you, you extract, you know how much uh, coal you use. So this is something you know quite well. The uncertainties are quite quite small. Uh, where we have really a problem is uh, on the land use emissions. So there are very large uncertainties. Um, and this is mainly land use cover change, uh, forests that are, are, are burned or that are converted into agricultural land, into pasture land. Um, and the uncertainties here are in the range of 50%. 45%. Um, and we also don't know, I mean, land do not only uh, emit carbon, they also can absorb carbon. And also these things are quite unknown. Huh? So they are a bit more known than the, than the sources, but uh, the error bars here is uh, still uh, in the range of 25%. Now the two or the, 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 the big 
unknown in this in this land part in the sources and sink part is forests so forests play a major role um half of if you, if you take for example a tree half of the tree is carbon if you burn the tree um this carbon will be released to the atmosphere if a tree dies for example in droughts with time um the the tree will will emit all its carbon to the atmosphere um so there is an important source but it's also a, a sink so trees can absorb enormous amount of carbon they're actually the most effective way to fight um uh, climate crisis if you want or the only natural way to to fight climate climate uh, crisis or to take up take out uh, carbon from the atmosphere um so this these two so forests uh, are, are a central part in this game and uh they are most unknown and especially they are very unknown in areas um where um they're most effective uh, which is in the tropics tropical forests beyond carbon um of course forests also play various other roles um forests have major effects on the socioeconomic uh sector many especially in developing countries many people rely on forest as a natural resource for burning material for building materials um they have they are one of the most biodiverse um ecosystems we have on the planet or in effect they're the most biodiverse um ecosystem especially the tropical forests they have cultural benefits so there's a, a lot of roles that forests play um and where we try to benefit from um more measurements to better understand how this uh, how this ecosystem changes uh, especially on the cl uh, changing climate now this was the overarching question so the next step if you build a satellite is um, you ask what are your requirements so if you want to measure forests um, what type of measurements do you need to answer these questions so first of all you need uh, to measure forest biomass so i just said um, if you take a tree half of the the weight of a tree is basically carbon so if you know the weight of, of a tree you also know how much carbon is stored um, we need as an additional constraint height and i will come that in a, in a second why we need height as well and we want to know where disturbance happens so you said the biggest uncertainty is uh on on converting forest into uh land other land used uh factors or when it when it burns so we want to really see where, where these disturbance factors are happening the crucial information need is in the tropics. Um, in the northern hemisphere, we know our forests quite well. Most of them, I think, ninety percent of the forests in northern hemisphere are managed forests. Uh, since more than hundred of years, we go in the forest, measure trees because they are a quite valuable resource. So we have quite a good understanding how these forests have been changing over the last uh, decades. Um, but where we really have a, a gap in our knowledge is in the tropics, and the tropics are really the the part of the of the land where, where, where most changes occur so where we have most deforestation for example 95 percent of the land use change flux comes from the tropics it's also the part which absorbs most of the for uh, most of the carbon so we have regrowth rates of um of 50 percent of the global biomass sink is in the tropics so this is really where we where we need information and we have least information so there's basically no measurements of these forest types available as of today um Next question is you 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 might ask which resolution you need you need high resolution low resolution there's different ways uh, to to size your system. Um, from the ecologists, we know that we need to monitor at the effective scale of change, so they really want to see um, where the change happens very locally, because uh, also this deforestation effects um, or this uh, these changes happen very locally in, in this regime, so if you have a two course resolution you miss all these little details. So you're going for a relatively high high resolution system in the range of uh, one to five hectares so one hectare is 100 by 100 meter square um, so the hectare scale is what you what you are aiming at um, then you need wall-to-wall -wall measurements so there's different ways to measure you can use lidar systems you can use imaging systems um, but the recommendation from the ecologist is really to measure wall to wall to have the continuous information over the whole over the whole image and you need repeated measurements it doesn't help you if you measure only once because then you only know the stocks you, but but you don't know how it changes and we are mostly interested in changes so you need several measurements over multiple years to identify deforestation and regrowth um, processes and finally, um, we need measurements in the range of, uh, of an accuracy of 20% um, of your absolute value. And this is more or less comparable to ground-based observations. Now, how do you measure a tree 
um, or how do you measure the weight of a tree? It's on ground already very difficult. So what you can do is you can cut down the tree. Um, you can take each element, you can weight it. And these people are doing this, but of course it's not very effective. You cannot cut the whole forest. It's uh, counterproductive. Um, and it's also very tedious work. Huh? So you don't do this very often. You only do this um, for some experiments uh, to, 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 to understand your forest. So what people have developed already since more than 100 years is um, forest census systems. So they measure basically structure parameters and convert the structure parameters into weight. And that's fairly easy. You can assume your, your tree is more or less a cylinder. So if you know the tree height, if you know the diameter of the tree, if you know the tree species, so the density of the wood, then you can easily convert this via very simple allometric equations to um, the weight of the tree. And if you know the weight of the tree, you can assume about 50% of this is carbon. Now, this is something we can also do from space. There are measurement systems, and you have learned uh, during this week uh, ways to uh, measure, for example, forest height, uh, to measure structure, um, and that come very close to what people are doing actually on the ground. So this is something we can exploit from space as well. Of course, when it comes uh, to reality, uh, if you go to the tropics, it's not that easy. Um, measuring a tree is, uh, can also be very difficult on, on, on ground. So people are, are quite used to working with uh, this sort of proxy information and to derive um, their carbon estimates from these proxy observations. Um, what can we do from space? Uh, so the most effective, if you look at the, at the requirements we had, we wanted to have wall-to-wall -wall measurements. So you need an imaging system. Um, you need sensitivity to structure that you can convert into biomass estimates. So if you look around the, the central capability that you can do from space, uh, what you end up most likely is uh, a SAR system. So SAR system gives you three different ways to measure structure. So the most simple way is on the left-hand side, you just take one image um, and because your radar will interact with uh, your medium, with the trees, uh, from the return signal, um, you can estimate some sort of structural information. Huh? It's not yet biomass, so you need to convert this into biomass, but it's a relative direct measurement of structure. The more structure you have on the ground, the more trees you have, the more weight. So it's a, a relatively straightforward system. You can use also polarimetry uh, to learn a bit about the scattering mechanism, to learn a bit more about uh, your structure. But it's a very simple technique that you can convert via empirical relations, for example, to biomass. The second thing is uh, Polinsar. So if you have not only one measurement, but if you have two or more measurements, um, you can combine it in a clever way. And I think you have learned this in this course, how to do this. And you can derive forest height from it. So with these two measurements, the structural measurements from the polarimetry, the height measurement from, from um, Polinsar, from interferometry, you're already getting close to what people are actually doing on the ground. And you can convert this um, then to, to biomass, and from this you can estimate carbon. And of course, then there's the, the most advanced technique, that's, that's TOMOSAR, uh, tomographic SAR. So if you add even more measurements, uh, you can layer through your forest, and you get this information not only for um, one layer, but you can get uh, structural information for each layer. And I will show you later on that this is actually the most accurate way to measure biomass um, from space. Now we know we need a SAR system. So the next question you, you, you ask is um, what frequency do you want to use? Um, and if you look at the frequency range, normally things scale uh, with uh, your wavelengths. So if you go to a very um, short wavelength expense, three centimeter wavelengths, you will be mainly sensitive to leaves. Uh, leaves don't contain a lot of carbon. So this is not, um, not the frequency band you would choose. You will go to, high, to, to longer wavelengths, L-band and P-band. So at P-band, for example, you're really sensitive. It's a 60 centimeter wavelength. You're really sensitive to, to elements of your tree that are in this range of 60 centimeters to the big stems, to the big uh, branches that contain most of the carbon. Another um, advantage of going to, to longer wavelengths is that um, you get a more coherent system. So Coherence is very important when you do interferometry to make your interferometric processing. Uh, the problem is if you have uh, only one satellite, if you have a repeat bus system, um, you lose coherency very quickly. So if you go, this is from an experiment we did in uh, a boreal forest in Sweden, 
there was a tower, um, and on this tower, we had a P-band, an L-band, and a C-band antenna, and they were recording all the time. And from these measurements, you can estimate basically how quickly your, your, your measurements decorrelate over time. So you see on the, on the, on the x-axis, you see uh, the difference, the temporal baselines between the measurements, and on the y-axis, you see the coherence. And you see, for example, these yellow uh, lines, these are from a C-band system. You see in less than a day, basically, your, your system decorrelates, and or at least over a forest system, you cannot apply interferometry any longer. Now, if you go to the longer wavelengths, uh, L-band in blue and then P-band in red, you see that the system becomes more and more stable. And you can even go uh, after six days or after 20 days, your coherence is still on a, on a level that you can apply interferometry that you would lose otherwise um, um, for, for example, for C-band and for L-band systems. So this really allows you to go to a repeat bus system. And this is very important for us because um, otherwise you need two satellites observing at the same time, which uh, makes the whole thing more expensive and um, programmatically uh, not feasible. Um, with all this and some additional figures, I, I have just put in here some of the higher level parameters that you define before you start building the satellite. So this is a list of uh, parameters you need to specify a SAR system. And you see some numbers, for example, um, you want to do interferometry. So you're interested in phase stability. So there will be a, a phase error requirement. You have uh, noise equivalent sigma requirements, so your, your 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 the noise term of the of the of the sensor. So all these all these figures you have to start to um, um, figure out before you start building a, a satellite, and then you 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 give this this figure to uh, the engineers, and they start to build a satellite uh, like here on the right hand side. So this was one of the first uh, design uh, figures we got for the biomass mission. You see a big reflector. Um, SAR system scale with wavelengths, so everything gets bigger, the, the bigger your wavelength is. This is actually one of or the biggest satellite, civilian satellite uh, that has been launched to space. Uh, the antenna is uh, 12 meters in diameter. Just to give you an impression, this translates to 140 square meter, so bigger than most of the apartments, I guess, you live in or houses. So it's really a big, a big structure. Uh, you see in green the, the feed arrays that uh, transmit the pulse to the reflector, and then it gets reflected to the ground and then received back. Um, one of the constraints I also wanted to show here uh, is a programmatic constraint is that we had to fit into a Vega launch. Vega is a small rocket. Um, and for these big uh, structures, this means a lot of constraints. So this is something you have to understand. Um, I don't know if you've heard in this course, uh, there's a lot of advanced SAR measuring systems you can uh, have systems that do scan on receive beam forming etc to extend your swaths to increase your resolution and all this for biomass this was not possible because it didn't fit on the platform so we went to a very simple SAR antenna so this is more or less technology that was also used on the ERS satellite that was launched 20 years ago so it's the most simple SAR that you can build which is also nice because you know it's working it's not very complicated but also it gives you um some limitation in terms of uh, performance. Um, and, and still, if you, if you look at the system, um, with these requirements we had, um, we achieve on the ground only a very small swath width, so 50 kilometers. And I come to this in a second, why this is important, or why you have to have this in mind. Huh? But still, despite this being a very big satellite, um, it's very difficult to achieve performance with this type of mission over wide swath and to have frequent uh, observation and i now show you a small video how how this works so i said well maybe going back to our requirements i said we need a repeat bus system to make interferometry so we want to repeat in a very short time so within days uh, we want to come back to the same time to uh, be able to make interferometry we also need repeated observation. That was a science requirement. So they want to have observations every six months, every year or so. They want to have one global map, which they can then track over time. So you have to, uh, you need for these requirements, typically you need a very wide swath uh, on ground to achieve this. But as I said, uh, for biomass, uh, this is a bit problematic because we, we don't get the performance with this system. And our swath is only 50 kilometers wide. So we have to play a bit of a trick here. And you will see in a minute, so this is the normal swath. We come back a second time, observe the same area with a slight drift to do interferometry. Um, we come back a third time even, 
And the third time is more or less an insurance. So for interferometry, you only need two measurements. The third measurement is for us a, a type of uh, insurance measure. Um, if we lose an observation, we still have uh, a backup. Also very important, uh, you change a bit the baselines and the baselines give you different sensitivities to different force types, but um, that's more detail. The problem is um, you see already, wait, uh, go a bit back. You see here, you still have uh, a lot of gaps. So if you would just continue with this uh, observation type, you would take uh, about five years or so to cover, to cover the whole globe. So you have to make a few tricks here. And the first trick we do is um, once we have uh, these three measurements, we turn the satellite a bit. Uh, so we, we observe a new area. And we can do this actually not only one time, we can turn it for a third time. So we get three swaths with this system um, with slightly different incense angles. But you will still see with the three swaths, um, we still have a lot of gaps, um, especially at the equator. So we'd have to make even more tricks. And the next trick we do is uh, we do some orbit maneuvers. So every after having three times three measurements, we will raise the satellite. So we turn the satellite a bit. We raise it to a different orbit. During this time, the Earth can rotate under your satellite. Then we bring the satellite back again, and we start over a new area. So this is all a very complicated system uh, from orbit control point of view, maneuvering point of view, but this is necessary to make this uh, uh, repeat bus observations and uh, to cover within a year's time um, the globe. Why am I telling you this? Um, it takes us still um, nine months to achieve global coverage, despite all these tricks we do. Now, if you do a retrieval system, if you make a global map based on this, you have to consider that within these nine months, you will see a lot of change in your, in your forest. And these changes are not only because there's deforestation or there's regrowth. This is also because um, moisture can change in the canopy. This can be freezing. This can be wet snow on your, on your trees or something. Huh? So there's a lot of things when you build your retrieval, when you, when you retrieve data from this mission, that you have to account for all these changes uh, in your retrieval somehow because you will not get the data, this frequent data to select the best data set that is optimized for this. So you have to build this into your retrieval. And this is actually one of the big research topics we have for this mission is how to account for all these varying signals, how to identify that you really get uh, only biomass and you don't see a moisture change, for example, in your canopy or that you see uh, just a freezing tree or something. Huh? Nope. I have to go to the next. Um, just a few words to the coverage. Um, we will systematically, because we have all these very complicated orbit maneuvers and, and covering strategy. So for all the forested area, we have a, a fixed acquisition scenario that cannot change. So we cannot say we want to observe a certain point at a certain time. Uh, we just start the mission and from there on it will go and, and, and record. So all the red areas will be covered uh, systematically. This is the areas that are um, forested areas. Uh, then we have, uh, because we launched the first time a PIV and SAR system, a lot of scientists came back and said, yes, uh, we're also interested to see some data over deserts, for example, or over ice sheets. Um, so we have, for these areas that are here in yellow, we will acquire data on the best effort basis. And then uh, over these blue areas, so there are some ocean windows, uh, we will even try something very experimental, where we don't know if it's of any use, but um, it's the first time we do it, so uh, we should try it at least. Um, over these areas, basically you get um, more or less over the red areas, you get one coverage every nine months, uh, both from ascending and descending orbit. So you get two coverage. In fact, the yellow areas are covered on the best effort basis. Um, and the, the other, this point four on this slide, uh, the other uh, striking features, you see some areas that are masked out and this is Europe and the US, which is, um, yeah, a bit surprising maybe that Europe, uh, because we are not allowed to observe all, over these areas, uh, comes a bit as a surprise for European mission that we are not even allowed to observe over Europe. Uh, the reason here is that uh, the US uh, operates a space object tracking radar system. So they, they observe missile, incoming military missiles mainly. Um, these are big radar systems and, and basically they have a primary location in the P-band frequency band. And when you launch a satellite, you always have to contact all these people and talk to them. And basically, they said, uh, we don't want to be disturbed by your satellite. So we don't allow you to operate over these, uh, over these uh, domains here. 
So this is something we are still negotiating. We try, but you talk to military people and they basically don't really listen to scientists, I would say. Um, so we will see, maybe we can lift this ban. If not, we have to survive without this. But it's actually not so critical. It might look very, very bad. It's not so critical. Um, as I said at the beginning, p band is really optimized to measure uh, tropical forest. So most of the tropical forest belt are still covered. So we only have in Central America a few regions uh, where we miss the data. Also, um, these northern hemisphere forests are not very dense forests. So you can work maybe with other frequencies, for example, L-band, which are also suited for this purpose. And also for these areas, uh, we actually know quite well about these forest systems because we have measurement systems on the ground um, to cover these. So the really critical areas are, are, are well covered. So just in a nutshell, the biomass mission, um, with taking all this into account, we have a fully polarimetric PEEP and SAR system. Um, it's a single satellite uh, or, um, operated in a polar sun synchronous orbit so that we can cover the whole globe. It has two mission phases. So the, the main mission is an interferometric mission. This is the, the, most of the, of the part of the mission will be done in interferometric mode, where we collect three measurements for each point on the earth in a repeated fashion. And at the beginning of the mission, we also have a tomographic phase, which allows us to exploit a bit uh, uh, advanced retrieval concepts based on SAR tomography. Um, global coverage is achieved in nine months, both on ascending and descending passes. So you get two coverages and the mission is designed for a five-year lifetime. Um, so you get uh, about seven to eight global coverages um, during this time. So far, I've only showed you um, some uh, graphics, basically. So the satellite really exists. It's currently built. Actually, it's um, very close to here at uh, CNES facilities, uh, not at CNES, at Airbus facilities, where they test the satellite. Um, and you see, basically, on the right hand side is the body of the satellite. It's quite a big structure. It's four meter tall. You see um, also some sub elements. So the the power amplifier on the left hand side, the feed, uh, the receiver unit on the on the right hand side for for the for the engineers here in the room uh, that might be interesting. You see the feed arrays here in the in the test chamber that uh, we have in in, in ESA, um, and I think the most the most striking feature of the satellite is really this big antenna that you see in the center part, and you also see how fragile this mesh is. So it's really uh, very uh, compact and. Uh, it's uh, quite a design challenge to to really unfurl this uh, antenna so that it doesn't get uh, get corrupted or or breaks. Now, how do we do? Just to 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 come back to the beginning, I I, I said we we use different ways to measure with this mission. So first of all, P-band, you penetrate into the forest, you you reach actually even the ground. Um, you're sensitive to the to the stems and to the big elements in the tree. Now, how do we use these measurement types? So, in the most simple way, you just take an an image, like is uh, illustrated here. Um, you also see that at P band, you are sensitive to trees, um, but you're not sensitive to the very low biomass trees. So, if you have single trees, you would not see that at P band because your wavelength is too long. You're not sensitive to this very low biomass uh, domains. You are mainly designed for the for the high biomass domains. And then, of course, if you if you fly over that a second time, you uh, can do interferometry. So you get uh, forest height information as well. It should come in a second. You get forest height. So with this information, that's the standard mode of the mission. You can already um, retrieve biomass more or less. And then if you if you repeat these measurements more often, you can even slice through the forest and you can uh, get a tomographic image where you get um, of each layer information of your backscattering coefficient that you can then, then use in your retrievals. Um, some words of caution here. I mean, biomass is often sold as a tomographic mission. Um, the resolution of biomass is very poor in the um, vertical domain. Uh, so the resolution is about 50 meter vertical. Now, if you take a typical forest in, in Europe, trees won't get taller than 30 meters. So you get maximum two layers. Um, if you go to a tropical forest, 
trees typically reach 60 meters, can get 60 meters tall, sometimes even 100 meters. So you get maybe four layers in a tropical forest, but that's about it. So you will, you will not really get a, a full 3D reconstruction of your forest, uh, but um, you just get a few layers basically that help you a bit in the retrieval. And I will come to that in a second. Um, the products we are going to deliver is forest biomass, forest height and disturbance at 200 meter resolution. That was basically said at the beginning, every nine months um, globally, excluding these SOTR regions. But the question is now, how do you actually retrieve this information? And I think you have learned probably in this course how, how or a lot about these retrieval systems. In, the, in my presentation, I would like to focus a bit on the forest biomass section because this is a bit special and this is our main product. Um, and I would like to go a bit into more detail here. So the most straightforward way, the easiest way is just to use your backscattering coefficients as you get them. And what is plotted here, and this is a plot actually from the very early days of the mission, when it was still very much pulsar focused. So you remember this is 20 years ago, there were no tomography, interferometry was in its early days. So what people did at that time is um, they collected data, um, backscattering coefficients of different forests. So we have here a forest in Sweden, Remingstorp, and then two tropical forests, La Selva and Baraku. You see the backscattering coefficient on the y-axis um, and is put into relation to a, a above ground biomass that is measured on the ground. It's at a log scale. Um, so, and you see that there is a fairly linear relationship between biomass and the backscattering coefficients. And the backscattering coefficient is here in HV. So it's HV backscatter, cross pole backscatter. And at that time, people started to use these very simple empirical relationships to retrieve biomass. Um, there you already see some problems. For example, the biomass or the, the backscatter of a boreal forest that has less biomass actually is higher than the biomass in a tropical forest. This is a bit counterintuitive. Um, one of the reasons is that uh, you have a lot of double bounce effects. It's a sparser forest, so you get double bounce effects in the forest. You get higher backscatter. Um, you have a more ordered, structured um, forest compared to tropical forest. Uh, you also see that for the tropical forest, your core, I mean, your, your your slope in your correlation is not that good. So it's uh, you, you, your sensitivity is not great. But I mean, you can you can do something with this. Now, um, when we started to do tomography, we started to learn a bit more and to understand a bit more how our measurements um, or the information that is contained in our measurements. And um, we started to rethink a bit how we built our algorithms. And this is an example from an experiment we were flying in French Guiana in Baraku. It's an airborne SAR, PEEP and SAR system that we were flying. Um, and again, it's the same type of plots I showed you before. It's a cross pole backscatter HV on the Y axis, uh, biomass on the X axis. And you see if you correlate that over this site, um, you see that, I mean, your correlation is close to um zero it's not significant so from this you cannot really retrieve uh, biomass with um with sufficient accuracy now in this in this experiment we're flying tomography with an airborne system so this gives you a very high resolution and you can actually learn a lot from these measurements um and when you look at the different layers in the forest um you see that if you look at the ground layer um you have no correlation with, uh, with biomass. So this is the second plot here where we extracted just the crown layer from this uh, tomographic stack. Um, and you see there's a, even a negative correlation. And this is of course makes sense. Your crown should not be correlated or your crown return should not be correlated to biomass. And then if you, if you go up a bit in the canopy, when you clean your measurements from these crown signals that contain a lot of information on the moisture of the crown, on roughness, on double bounce effects, you start to see how your, how your um, relationship between the backscatter and uh, the biomass starts to increase. And if you look at the, at the layer, for example, here is the 30 meter layer where there's a lot of biomass contained, you, uh, you get a very nice correlation of, um, of your backscatter with, uh, with, with biomass. Now, tomographic phase, we have only one in the mission lifetime at the beginning. So we cannot use this concept that we extract just uh, a layer, uh, clean up the ground and then get the, get the top layer and uh, build our retrieval based on, on, this, uh, on this layer. We can only do this at the beginning of the mission, but you can actually do some, um, some tricks. So it's not really some tricks. It's uh, one of our scientists called, you can do some poor man's tomography. 
uh, even during the rest of the mission. So you don't have a full stack. You don't get seven images that allow you to do the full tomography. You have only three images. Um, and that means that you cannot really resolve a lot of different layers. But you, what you can do is you can resolve two layers with these three images. And this is something we exploit um, in our retrievals. So we build a filter on our satellite images that allow us to notch out the ground signal, which is the most disturbing factor, um, and to focus a bit uh, on, the, on the vegetation canopy. So it's not as accurate as tomography. We'll get really a very clean layer. Here you get only two layers. But at least you get rid of this ground layer that, that causes a lot of uh, negative correlation in your system. Now, if you do this, um, same plots as before, you see the single image type. So if you take a single image, do your retrieval on the single image, you see basically no correlation. Um, on the right-hand side, you see the Tomosar um, results. Wait, let me remove this window here. And you see this gives you basically the best correlation between biomass and, uh, and the ground truth data with six images. Uh, so if you have only two images or three images here in the, in the center, and this is the biomass case for, the, for most of the mission, you actually come very close to the, to the high precise demographic phase. And this is something we will exploit in the retrieval. So we do this ground notching and focus a bit on the vegetation elements. And that basically brings together not only the intensity-based retrieval, but also interferometry into one retrieval. Um, and this helps you also in, in, in another way. So I, I, I told at the beginning that um, one of the big challenges in this mission is that you, um, or that we have to, to deal with changing environmental conditions. We have to deal with uh, moisture changes in the canopy and all these sort of things. Um, so with a simple empirical relationship, you will not get very far because you, that brings everything together. So any moisture change, you will convert in biomass changes and this is something you don't want. Now, if you want to do a, a bit a more detailed analysis, you need to move to physical models. And this is what we tried here. And uh, this is just a very simplified physical model that describes uh, the backscatter that you measure um uh in three elements so you have volume scattering you have double bound scattering and you have uh, scattering from the soil and uh we used uh, used here the true and glory model um and this is three expressions that relate to volume double bounds and and the soil and that describes your scattering based on your incense angle based on 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 uh on uh, biomass um on the reflectivity uh, properties of your soil now if we if we cancel out the ground uh, you already get rid of uh, two of these main terms. So you get rid of a lot of uh, complexity in your physical model. And basically, you're only left with the volume scattering term. And this is something you can invert with a limited number of observations. And you can start to build in some physics in your, in your retrievals. And below here is an example how we do this. So this is um, actually the... An example of, a, of a, uh, Gabon, La Lope, uh, where we were flying with uh, the German DLR aerospace system, p system, and you see that uh, your 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 um, retrievals actually work quite well. So this is estimated HEP from from the airborne system and the reference HEP from ground measurements, and you get more or less a, a very nice match, and you even achieve more or less the twenty percent uh, accuracy threshold that we need to to meet that were given to us to, from the science community. Coming close to the end of my presentation, um, for everyone who is interested here, all these algorithms that we have built for biomass are open source. Um, this is the first Earth Explorer where we share all the code that we develop and where we don't only share the code, but you're invited to contribute to this code. So if you can uh, go on this GitHub repository, you can download the code, you can do your modification, you can submit it, and then at ESA we will re review these changes. And if they are beneficial for the retrieval, it will flow into the, the official um, ESA retrieval system. So this is the first time we try this out. There's a lot of um, unknowns there. We don't really know the process yet, if it works and how it works, but at least we would like to, to invite everyone to contribute and we make an effort um, that uh, scientists who are not in the core science team, for example, can still change the algorithm and can, can submit their changes. Um, biomass, um, as I said at the beginning, it's not only a forest mission, it's the first time we look on the earth in the p-band frequency. So it's a a very new way to look at the earth. And there's of course a lot of other applications as well. So we penetrate not only in forest, we also penetrate into ice. We have an interferometer, so you can use ice structure information. You can 
observe ice flows. You can look over desert areas, so you can penetrate sand. And this is the second example, so you see the subsurface geology. So you see, for example, riverbeds in the, in the deserts uh, that are buried by sand. Um, you can observe topography under vegetation. And this is just uh, some examples of um, other applications. So for those of you who are not really interested in forest, there's a lot of other things you can do with this mission. Beside this, so topography, desert, and, and, and ice, uh, we also observe ocean, uh, especially salinity uh, is, is of interest there. We are less, we have a very long wavelength. We are less um, susceptible to, uh, uh, to roughness, to wind. So you have more direct sensitivity to other parameters like salinity. You can also measure winds or wave under very high wind conditions when other satellite sensors saturate. Um, so, but this is uh, really very experimental. You look at sea ice, for example, or um, for space weather applications to the ionosphere. So p sar is very much affected by the ionospheric layer and you can um, also retrieve some valuable information here. Finally, um, I, I've heard that you made some experience already with the map and it was not the best experience. Um, some, some time ago, um, well, the classical way of uh, distributing data to the communities, you have uh, an FTP server, people can download it and can work on their own on, on, their, on their computers. Um, but with biomass, we wanted to go a bit of a different way, uh, which was very much um, um, following the example, for example, of the Google Earth engine, where you bring the people to the data and not the data to the people. Uh, so that we changed this paradigm. And we built this map platform, which works actually, or which should work like the Google Earth engine, if it works. Uh, uh, it's still on a demonstration case. So it's the first time we built this platform and you have experienced there is a, lo a lot of unknowns where, you, where we have to improve, where we have to learn. Um, it's the first time we do this. Uh, and we are of course very interested in feedback and of people using this because this is the only way we can improve this platform and we can go back to industry and, and, and provide feedback to them to improve this. This thing. But the idea is really here that we bring the people to the data, they can work on this platform, they can also exchange, they can share their results, they can develop code together. And the interesting part here is this is not only done by ESA, this is a joint project we do with NASA together, uh, because NASA is also has already launched one satellite, the JEDI mission is a, a LIDAR mission, uh, the NISA mission is an l SAR mission, and both these missions have uh, a forest objective, so they also want to measure forest biomass, and the scientists were basically always claiming that uh, they don't want to work only with one mission, they want to work in a multi-mission context, they want to uh, benefit of the different features of these missions. So we built this, uh, this map platform that also allows you not only to access the biomass data, but also the NISA and the Jedi data and to work on one platform um, on this data, if it works. So to summary, um, Biomass was proposed in 2005, so nearly 20 years ago. We worked towards a launch in quarter one, 2025. So, so we are in the last uh, or, or close to the finishing line. Actually, the satellite is more or less ready. So the only thing that is now missing is a launcher. And that's the, the reason why we have to wait until uh, 2025. Um, Biomass is the first P-band SAR and the first systematic radar tomographic space-borne mission. It's a true Earth explorer with a lot of unknowns. Um, we only know from very limited campaign data set what we can see at P-Band. Um, and we will really only start learning when the first data flows in. And then I invite every one of you to really contribute uh, to this and to help us explore this, uh, this uh, mission. It's the first open source Earth Explorer. So the first, Earth, the first ESA mission where we really make all the code available and where we also invite um, you as a community to contribute to the development of these algorithms and to evolve them. And of course, it's um, a mission that goes uh, far beyond forests. So we also go into uh, desert application, ice applications, uh, ionosphere, space weather applications. So there's room for quite some diverse uh, research and science. And with this, I'm closing my presentation on biomass. Do you have any question? Oh, you can deploy if you want. <laughs> Thank you. Any question to biomass? Yes, I start here then.
what does it mean to the time? Is it somehow related to time and proximity? Let me see. So, basimetry, not really, I mean, basimetry is also, um, it's not here, right? It's not here, but you're right, basimetry is one of the application domains. Um, and, and the fact is you see, or the basimetry as an imprint on the, on the sea surface, on the structure, on the wave structure of the, of the sea surface. So in coastal regions, so not on the on the open water, but when 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 there is only a shallow water layer, then usually the wave patterns that you observe on on top of the ocean reflect the symmetry of the ocean bed. Um, this has been shown on campaign data, uh, which is very high resolution, which has a very no, low noise level. I don't know if with biomass we can do the same thing. So this is only because the resolution is too coarse, uh, so you might not see all these different wave patterns. So basimetry might be an ocean application, but it's a, it's a very experimental thing. There was, did this answer your question or? It's, it's an indirect measurement, yes, exactly. It's very indirect. And, and usually you need high resolution, you need, uh, a lot of repeated measurements, which we don't get from biomass either. So there's a lot of question marks if this, this could be done. And, and it, I think in the literature, there's only one paper who has ever shown that you can do this. So I, there was one at the very back. Well, the, the fuel lasts more or less for five years. Um, it's part of the payload, of course. Uh, every, every satellite has its own fuel reserve. I mean, you need to maneuver these days quite a lot, not, not only for scientific purposes or for technical purposes, but also, for example, to avoid space debris. So on some missions, we have to maneuver every second week to avoid uh, collisions with space debris. Um, so this is something which we do on a routine basis, and it's part of the, of the whole program. Um, the fuel we have should last for five years, um, but it's always a question how long it lasts at the end is always a question of how accurate you launch your, your satellite. So there are satellites which are launched in the exact, in exactly in the position you want to, to be. Um, so the, the launch that checks your satellite at exact the point you want to be. And then you save a lot of fuel that you can use later on. Um, if you're, 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 you, you, you don't reach your exact position, then you have to use a lot of fuel to get into your, your right satellite position. So you burn a lot that you have not then as a reserve later on. So, but for us, the minimum is five years. And this we will cover for sure. If we can extend later on, depends a bit on how many maneuvers we have to fly to avoid collisions, how accurate we launch the satellite, and, and these sort of questions. Is there, yes? Um, we are at 650 kilometers, I think. Hmm. We, we, have, we, are, we are obliged to bring every satellite back to Earth. So this is, this is applicable since a few years. We are as ESA because we launch, it's a French space law. So the French in their space law say that everything that is launched into space has to be brought back. And because we're launching with a French uh, or from a French uh, spaceport, uh, we have to apply to uh, French space law. So at the end of the day, we will have a decommissioning phase where we bring back the satellite and it will burn in the atmosphere. So subsurface geology, I can maybe go to the end of this video. Um, it, there is no real technique how to use this information. So what you see here is a simple image, a SAR image of a desert. And this is an L-band. Huh? So this is not P-band, it's an L-band. 
So if you have a very dry surface, if, you're, if your sand is very dry and it really only works in dry surfaces, um, then you can penetrate the sand and you're reflected on the bedrock. And this is what you see here. Um, and, and this information, they use, for example, these black lines here, this is uh, river beds. So paleoclimatologists use this to discover river beds, for example, in the Sahara deserts, but they just do this visually by following these dark lines. Huh? Um, at B-band, we will penetrate even deeper than in L-band, so we might have more, more information, or at least we have information about different layers, uh, but it's not yet designed how to use this really in terms of a complex retrieval scheme um, and, and these sort of things. Um, the second question was... The, how this is done? Basically, we observe every object that is flying in space, so we have uh, space tracking systems. Um, we exchange information between the space agencies. And whenever there is a close risk um, of collision, uh, we decide if we have to maneuver the satellite. So we bring the satellite to different orbit and we try to avoid a collision and bring it back again. This is um, modern satellites, for example, Starlink of uh, Elon Musk. They have AI on board, so the satellite decides by himself if there's a collision or not, and you can trust this information or not. Uh, but uh, but there's different ways. Uh, but the classical way is really you you predict the orbit, you see if there's a collision risk, and if this collision risk uh, comes to a certain level and it's really a very low level, zero point zero zero four percent or something of of risk. Um, then you decide uh, to maneuver the satellite. And that's done manually. So you send up a command, satellite flies in a different orbit, you bring it back again with a new command, and you go on. Yes, we, we cover the entire about we cover the entire of this of Antarctica. Um, on a best effort basis, so we want to cover at least once the whole Antarctic region. Um, there are some other domains with some smaller windows where we want to do interferometry, so we want to collect more information, or the sea ice window, we want also to collect as much information as possible. Um, of course, a SAR system, you, you always have a hole because you have a slight inclination of your satellite. So, but the, it's, it's a left looking satellite, so the, the hole is minimized on the Antarctic. And on the Arctic, we are not allowed to observe anyway. So, this is um, dropped out. Southern Ocean, over the ocean, we have only a few windows um, that we observe. And these windows have mainly been defined. Um, for example, the Amazon here is fresh water influx. So this is very interesting for salinity, sea surface salinity. There's others uh, like the Agulas here in South, um, um, South Africa is uh, regions of very strong current systems. So it's basically systems where, where ocean scientists said there's some interest uh, having P-band measurements, um, but this can be changed. So this mask is not uh, cast in stone. So if someone comes with a nice idea, with a science idea, um, you can make a proposal um, and you can, uh, we can try to, to program the satellite and cover whatever area you need. Okay, one last question. Yes, so this is an issue. Um, at P band, of course, every surface is rather flat. So also this scales with wavelengths. So you are, you 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 usually are close when you don't have any any structure on your on your vegetation. Your measurements will be close to um, the noise floor, so you don't get any signal basically back. You only see noise. Uh, the system has been designed to cover at least over land surfaces. We, we should be sensitive enough. So you should see, um, you should be well above the noise floor. Also, this is the, the number I was giving you here, minus 28 dB or something, is uh, the worst case. So it's only on the edges. So over most of the swaths, we reach values well below minus 30 dB, minus 34 dB at the center of the swaths. So it's much better than uh, what we get here. Um, the issue becomes, I think, over the ocean. When you have over the ocean uh, a very uh, flat surface, 
uh, then you will be very close to your noise uh, floor and you will just get a, a, a black image back basically. But over land, we should be pretty safe, I think. Okay, with this, I, mo I move to the next presentation. Um, Roselle. So first of all, I would like to acknowledge my colleagues, uh, Malcolm Davidson and um, Lorenzo Janini, who prepared actually this presentation. Um, and I'm, 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 I'm only giving, um, presenting their work basically. So Roselle is uh, another radar mission that we built in the space agency. If you remember uh, at the start of my previous presentation, I showed a graph of the different satellite families. So this is um, a mission that exists in the Copernicus system where we built satellites uh, on, on some heritage. So we, we had already in the past for P-band, it was the first time we launched a P-band satellite in space. So it's all a bit unknown and um, um, we, we go a bit into the dark. On Elben satellite, there's a lot of knowledge already available. So we have Arlo system, for example, from Chaksa. We have Southcom Elben satellite. So there is already services developed on this data set. There's already a lot of knowledge of how to use Elben data. And this justifies basically why we can uh, implement Roselle as an operational mission concept that usually is not only one satellite, but you have uh, two satellites and there's much more um, operational um, background on this mission. Just to give you a context, I, I don't know, I'm probably most of you are family, familiar with the Copernicus um, or Sentinel mission family. Probably most of you are familiar with Sentinel 1 AB, as you're in the right, radar course, in the SAR course. This is our SAR, C band SAR uh, heritage mission. You have Sentinel 2, is an optical high resolution mission, Sentinel 3, and an optical um, medium resolution mission, and then atmospheric missions. Um, all these missions, so Sentinel 1 A and B, uh, have been launched in space, at least for Sentinel-1, 2, 3, and 5P. Um, for Sentinel-1, actually Sentinel-1B, we, we, we just lost a few weeks ago um, that uh, got damaged and we could, not, we could not bring it back to life. So there's only one satellite now in, in, in space, uh, but we are very close to launching the C and D units. So in, in a few months time, uh, we hope that the C, C unit will be, will be up there and then there comes a fourth unit. Now on the Sentinel-1, there is also a next generation that is currently designed um, that will replace uh, the Sentinel-1 uh, ABCD. It's basically the same thing. It's again a C-band SAR system using a bit of di different technology. So you get uh, some advanced features, better, better resolution, um, better coverage um, on, on this uh, next generation that will, that will only be launched in uh, 2030, so past in, in about uh, 10 years time or so. And uh, beside this, uh, family of mission that already exists, that is already flying, that it will be continued uh, for very long time into the future. We have also recently started to look into observational gaps and how to fill these gaps um, with uh, Earth observation systems. And there were um, six missions identified as high priority. Uh, and these are called the Copernicus expansion missions. Um, and one of it is Roselle, is an Elben SAR mission that should complement the C-band SAR and add to um, mainly to Arctic and cryosphere monitoring purposes, land and emergency mapping and ground motion and soil moisture services. And beside that, you have also other missions, hyperspectral imaging, land surface temperature uh, measurements, imaging, radiometer, uh, a carbon mission, atmospheric carbon mission, and uh, crystal is an is a altimeter mission for polar ice and, and snow topography. Um, From a timeline, where, where, fit, where, where do we fit in? I, I already explained. So we have Sentinel-1A in space. That was actually the first Sentinel mission that was launched. We have Sentinel-1B um, that followed uh, a few years after. And you see there that uh, the B satellite uh, we lost uh, in 2022. And uh, Sentinel-1C is uh, just ready for launch. So we are um, just waiting for a launcher. And then Sentinel-1D will replace Sentinel-1A. And then there is again two measurements, uh, two systems in place. Roselle will um, or is anticipated to be launched in 2029 uh, time game, so before the, the end of this decade. Um, and it will really fly in, 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 um, in synergy with the Sentinel 1 
uh, C-band systems. And then on top, you see the next generation that will come a bit later uh, in time. For the Rosell mission, we are currently in phase C. So this is an engineering phase uh, where, where you really start to build the satellite. So in phase C, you start to build the components of um, or the individual components. And after phase C comes phase D, where you put everything together and where you start testing the whole system. So, but this is something that is already in, in build. Um, a few words to, to the applications. So Roselle is really designed as a, a Swiss knife mission. It serves a lot of purposes. All this uh, application address um, some of the Copernicus services. Um, of course, this is a, a Copernicus mission. We contribute to the um, global land monitoring system, uh, to the climate system, to the marine environmental system, to the emergency system. Uh, to security and meteorological applications, so really covering all the aspects of Copernicus. Um, we have geohazards monitoring, so deformation, landslides, urban subsidies, and flooding, and I will come uh, to each of these uh, later with a separate slide. We have land use in agriculture and forestry, uh, especially forest biomass and structure observations. Um, soil moisture, so agriculture, very important application for Copernicus. Um, cryosphere and Arctic um, applications, so sea ice characterization, ice sheet and glacier velocity, snow water equivalent, we have marine monitoring, ocean surface winds and swell properties, and finally um, maritime security applications, so iceberg uh, tracking and location, vessel location, oil spill location, um, but I will come to each of these in a separate slide. Um, to show you a bit what the benefits of, of, of having another SAR system, L-band SAR system in space that is a slightly longer wavelength than C-band. Um, so first slide, uh, geohazards monitoring ground motion services. You see two images here, one from this um, C-band system, and this is from a landslide in Sunkoshi. Um, and on the right-hand side, you see the, this landslide monitored with um, a C-band, Sentinel-1 SAR. And you already see when, I mean, you can observe or you can do interferometry quite well, as long as there's no vegetation. If, as long as there's no vegetation coverage, you have coherence in your system, um, but you lose that outside and forested areas where you have trees, for example. Now, when we go to L-band, we have uh, much more sensitivity to those vegetated areas. So you really extend the, the, the region that you can, can observe uh, with L-band and you add really to, um, to your system. Um, you have seen here this plot I've shown you before already. So you see that it's at C band for repeat bus system. When it comes to vegetation, so this is a forested site, you, you lose your coherence. And this is basically why we don't cover the whole area here. When you go to L band, you have uh, much more sensitivity. You keep your coherence. You can do more interferometry over vegetated area. So this is really filling a, a gap of C band or complementing C band and providing a, um, more information. Uh, on landslides. Um, biomass mapping, of course, I, I, this is not the biomass mission, so it's not P-band, uh, but it's still very valuable um, in certain aspects. I, I told you before that we have problems, for example, for uh, North America and Europe, we're not allowed to observe um, in these um, not so dense forest regions. So their L-band, for example, complements a lot um, and can give you really um, um, an estimate on the low biomass domain. Um, another feature of, bio, of, 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 um, of Roselle that is very nice. Um, I told you before, it's very important to get a, a handle on this environmental variability of your scene. Um, in biomass, we cannot do this. We have only one snapshot every nine months. So we don't know really what, what, what happens in terms of moisture changes, of, of, of wind, of, of weather changes. Now with uh, Roselle, you have a, a revisit of six days globally and three days over Europe. And you can really learn from this time series. So this gives you really information and you can go for those scenes that are most sensitive to biomass and you can exclude those scenes that are corrupted by other environmental uh, effects. So you can actually uh, use this and it has been used in the past a lot. Um, ILOS 2 was the workhorse uh, for all the biomass mapping uh, stuff globally. And this is something um, Roselle will, will, will continue. So moisture changes. Um, Soil moisture is one of the big application domains. Agriculture, food security is uh, very important topics, uh, especially in a, in a warming climate um, where droughts become more critical and more often uh, or extreme events uh, become uh, more, more, more frequent. 
Um, C-band is used here quite a lot. So there are monitoring systems that uh, do soil moisture from C-band. Um, but you already see here, so this is uh, over a campaign we were flying in Germany. So on, on top, you have a, a C-band image. Uh, below, you have the L-band, the corresponding L-band image. You have here um, lots of um, different field types. So sugar beet, barley, wheat, um, and potato fields in different polarizations. So the light color is always VV, the darker color is always VH. Um, and you see when you do the left-hand plot uh, C-band that you very quickly saturate. So once you, when you have a bare field, you can measure soil moisture quite well. Um, as soon as you get uh, vegetation on your field, then of course you get the vegetation component in your signal and, and your correlation of soil moisture starts to deteriorate. And it's very difficult to get uh, rid of this signal. Now, if you go to L-band, you have a longer wavelength, you can penetrate deep into vegetation, so you're not so sensitive to vegetation any longer. Uh, and you see that you retain uh, some sensitivity there. So again, L-band really filling a gap of, of C-band um, for vegetated fields. CI is monitoring here again, uh, um, an image example from, um, where was it? Um, doesn't say. Ah, Buffin Bay, yes, thank you. <laughs> From Buffin Bay, so on the left-hand side, you have uh, the C-band image uh, from Radasat. Uh, on the right-hand side, you have the ILOS image. And already in these two images, you see that you, you see some differences in the structure. So L-band really helps you uh, in the CI's classification, the type of, of classification. But not only that, um, the, the second advantage of having this L-band system is also that you can fill a temporal gap. Um, so you have more observations and you can, for example, better um, observe sea ice drifts, uh, changes in, in, in the sea ice properties. So again, uh, a, a gap filling with, uh, with the sea vent Sentinel-1 system. Land, land ice and seasonal snow. Um, this is an example uh, from the Larsen Glacier. Um, on the left-hand side, you see again the C-band image, and you you see that you you you, you lose your coherence when you when you come in, in certain areas, and and this is something where you where you still get uh, coherence on your L-band system, and these are mainly areas that are, for example, very rough, and where in L-band you you penetrate a bit deep into the ice, you get uh, two more stable layers into the ice, and and you get uh, um, better information content in your L-band system. So you can you can fill some of the big gaps, for example, here on the southern part that you cannot observe with C-band. Um, there's also some ideas to use this to, to measure salt water equivalent. Uh, it's one of the big, or well, the holy grail in Earth observation these days uh, to, to estimate salt water equivalent, uh, snow water equivalent um, from satellite sensors. And there are some ideas how to use uh, the phase information in L-band um, to, to retrieve um, snow properties. Maritime monitoring, um, again, to fill temporal gaps with, so you get more frequent observations. You can combine C-band and L-band. Um, you're less affected by, by rough sea, so it's easier to detect ships. It's easier to detect oil spills um, with L-band. Um, and this is something um, that also has a, a widespread application. A few words to the system. So coverage will be global excluding the Antarctic. Um, the revisit time of two satellites, so it's, a, it's designed as a two satellite system. A constellation of two satellites will be six days globally um, over Europe every three days. Um, and of course, if you go higher, then you get more frequent observations one day in the Arctic. Um, we are currently in phase C, I told you at the beginning. So we will, or the launch, the first unit should be launched in 2028. The second unit in two, two years late in 2030. For the imaging system, it's an L-band system with 85 megahertz um, bandwidth. There's two modes, a dual pole mode and a quad pole mode. Um, there's a wave mode capability for ocean applications. The resolution is about 50 meter square. Um, so a high resolution system with a very low noise level for ocean application and a very wide swath of 250 kilometer that allows you uh, to have this very frequent observation. The whole system is designed in, uh, to, to allow synergistic observation with Sentinel-1. So the, the swaths are co-located to so, so support both uh, to fly in a convoy, but also to fly in a, in a phased approach uh, to, to minimize um, or to maximize uh, temporal coverage. 
The latency of this is an operational system, so you will receive data 10 minutes after sensing uh, over Europe and uh, 200 minutes um, globally. So this is really designed for operational applications. And also, I think an important feature of this, which is not really explored yet, but which could be explored in future, um, the satellite has been designed that we can fly a companion satellite with it. So you could extend this mission to an interferometric mission um, that allows you instantaneous uh, interferometry um, and polinsar and tomography uh, from one from one platform. But there's no plans at the moment to do this. So this is something um, for, for the future. The imaging systems, so there's uh, two main modes, uh, the, the interferometric white sword modes in dual pole. Um, which and, and the quad pole mode, which are more or less identical. Um, of course, if you go to quad pole, if you add polarizations, you have to pay a, a price. And this price was here paid in terms of resolution. So the dual pole mode is uh, 50 square meter resolution. The quad pole mode is only 100 square meter resolution. If it's still um, uh, high resolution, I think for, for many applications, very sufficient. Um, so, um, on the... On the coverage, it's always on over Europe, over the Arctic and coastal Antarctic, um, and over global tectonic areas. Uh, and for all the rest, um, it will be, well, land masses will be observed every 12 days, and with a dual system every six days, over other areas like Europe, for example, and the Arctic, you have uh, the double, basically, or half the, the revisit time, so six days and three days with, with two uh, satellites. Wave mode is always on over open ocean, so this is something we know very well from Sentinel One, and uh, which has um, which will be also available through um, through Roselle. As I said, there's two options to fly the satellite, and this is not fully decided yet how to fly that. Um, you can so the the, the orbit is uh, faced with the Sentinel One orbit, so it's really. Um, the idea here is not to have an independent mission, but really to complement uh, the Sentinel-1 seabend observations. And you can do this in two ways. Um, you can optimize the revisit. So you face the satellite uh, to fly in the gaps of Sentinel-1 to have Roselle observations. For example, for sea ice drift, this was, um, well, this was a, a request coming from sea ice drift community that wanted to have very frequent observations. Um, you can also fly in a, in a convoy, so just one minute after you take a Sentinel-1 observation, you take an L-band observations from Roselle. Uh, this is more for, um, for example, for land applications where you want to have uh, both frequencies at the same time. Um, all the data that we collect, of course, will be free, fully, and, and, and open to you. So um, this is like for all the other Copernicus missions. Um, there's a consistent acquisition mask, uh, consist consistent acquisition throughout the year to allow data stacks, which are especially important for interferometry. So for all these landslide applications. So um, this is uh, a pre-programmed uh, satellite scenario, acquisition scenario. Um, another aspect of this mission is that with Roselle, um, they want to move to ARD analysis ready data. So there will be different products, but uh, we already know from Sentinel-1 that the most popular product is a ground range detected product. So it's, it's really projected on the ground. It's already multi-looked, so it's ready to use. Um, it's more popular than uh, this land range product that you use for interferometry. So this will be also supported by, um, by Roselle, uh, which makes this ARD ready products available on a routine basis. Conclusions, um, we are currently preparing for this mission. So we are in phase C uh, on the first, in the first month of the phase uh, C, where you start to build uh, the, the components of the satellite and finish the design of these components. Um, and we will bring this forward for a launch in 2028. Um, it's a new enhanced capability in L-band compared to existing missions, a, a very low noise equivalent zero. Uh, Whitesworth uh, high resolution system um, that will actually add to existing L band systems in terms of, of uh, observation characteristics. But it will also add in terms of uh, information content to Sentinel 1. And that's uh, the reason why we fly this mission in, uh, in the constellation. Um, 
and that's a very important uh, aspect of, of, of Roselle that it should not be seen as an individual mission, but always in combination with, with St. Elmon. Um, there is currently a lot of activities starting on on science. So I said 2028 is only the launch date, but there's a lot of campaigns that are currently planned. We were just finishing a campaign in Germany, for example. There's some snow campaigns um, to, to really test the L-band retrieval system. So if you as a scientist are interested to work um, on these L-band systems, uh, drop me a note and I can put you in touch with Malcolm or with, with uh, Lorenzo um, to explore these, these scientific opportunities. And with this, I close the Roselle presentation. Any questions? I hope I can answer. Um, not really, I think. So the map is really there for the Earth explorers, and there is uh, also ideas to expand this map, not only to biomass, but to the other Earth explorers. For the Copernicus, yes, there is actually map type systems, but they're all commercial. So this is in the hands of the European Commission. There's three platforms, for example, Creadias is one of these platforms where you can access uh, the data uh, and you have also the, the computing resources available on these platforms, but these are commercial systems. Some of these are supported by ESA. We have the Eurodata Cube, for example, where you get access to all the Copernicus platforms. And if you run, for example, an ESA study, you can uh, get a grant to uh, also compute there. But it's not... I, I think it's, it has a, a, a bit more of a, of a commercial uh, flavor. Of course, you get also the data at the Google Earth engine, so you can uh, do things there. You have it on the Amazon cloud, um, so they all host these data sets, and this will be included on, this, on these platforms as well. But I also have to say that, um, I mean, 2028 is still far away. Um, Maybe they pick up this idea of, of these map platforms and, and also implement this uh, for scientific applications uh, for the Copernicus missions. Similar to Sentinel-1. I cannot tell you the exact number, but it's similar to Sentinel-1. Yes, it's the same concept. No. The, the only way would be uh, to launch a companion satellite and there were past studies. Uh, so we got um, a proposal to launch a companion, for example, to SAUCOM, which is all in L-band SAR system. So this was studied for quite some while and you can do very nice uh, tomographic analysis by launching a passive companion. So a very simple system, but um, well, Roselle would have the capability, but you still need to have the, the companion satellite launched. But this could be an idea for a future Earth Explorer, for example. And NISA? Yes, I think, I mean, I think in terms of characteristics, they are very similar. I mean, they have the same revisit cycle, they have the same type of applications. So, they serve the same communities in terms of characteristics. There's maybe uh, Roselle is a bit superior, but it's also only launched in, in after NISA basically has been flown. But I think what we what we learn from NISA, you can directly apply to to Roselle. Steve, 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 mm -hmm. the, yeah. Steve, yeah. That, that I, 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 I don't know, that, that I, I have to check. Yes, because this is a scanning system. So Roselle is scanning, but I don't know the details about the, the, the scanning. Yes, but I don't know the exact detail if, if NISA and, and Roselle really use exactly the same way that I cannot answer, but. Good, then I suggest we close it. Um, and I thank you for your attention. I hand over to Magda.